Yesterday, we had the privilege of having Pastor Chidi with us um, yesterday afternoon. And for those of you who came and attended, I'm sure you were blessed. Um, and when I got home, um, I know a couple of people, uh, we had a bit of testimony sharing time. Um, and I had a, uh, my colleague come in as well, and she, uh, I was really surprised to see her. Um, uh, she's a Muslim girl, and a very dear colleague worked with her for 15 years. She's my staff, and on Friday when she said to me, I'm coming to your church, and I went, really? She said, I saw that thing, and I want to know what that is. And she was sitting right at the back, so I went and sat with her, and all the while I was praying, praying, interceding for her situation, because I know what she's going through. And you know, so amazing, I said at the end, and Pastor Chitty said, for prayer. I said, do you want to come up for prayer? And she came up for prayer. She came up for prayer, and we prayed for her son. And Pastor Chitty knew straight away that she was a non-believer, and He's going to mentor and coach her son in soccer and bring the word of God to him. Isn't that amazing? So we exchanged numbers yesterday, and I'm believing for a miracle. That and Pastor Chidi and my, myself, we stand in the gap to know that that whole family will be saved. But even, even after that, I got another uh, message, and the message is from, I won't disclose who it is. The lady was here, um, not here today, but she was here yesterday. She says, Dearest Maria, I thank God for today. It's truly a confirmation of what I went through for many years. And to expect that I was thinking... It, made it even worse, and I thought it was all normal and, and should be accommodated. Growing up as a child was difficult and painful. I was molested by my stepdad. My mother committed suicide when I was six. My parents separated for three years. Went on, I went on to live with my dad and stepmom, but we went straight into boarding school after. The reason for that is that they didn't want me at home. Because because of financial difficulties, we went and stayed with my aunt for years, and they abused us. Until today, my dad knows nothing about this. I left school very early. I struggled in school and don't even know how many times I failed. To be to be fun or full of to be fun of to be made fun of. So she must have been writing really fast. To be made fun of or experience rejection was my daily living style. Growing up, I probably had thousands of jobs. I could never keep a job for a long period, and I lost all my jobs. I'll just leave without notice or telling anybody. I always felt alone and isolated from everyone. I was very happy in my own country. There are many things in my life I've done. I'm not going to mention them. To feel accepted and loved and wanted. But the more I did those things, the more rejection and emptiness I felt. My heart was never settled. I moved around a lot. I had so many hobbies that I never finished. I'll now start something I don't have the patience to finish it. I just throw it all away. Not because there was another or different opportunity. It's because I always tell myself I'm useless and I can't do anything right. I was truly searching for experience. I started to question life when I was 11 years old. I hated my life with a passion, and I was 11. I just wanted to die. I carried that through with me for many years. Two weeks ago, I went to a friend's house to do volunteer work, and when we had finished working for the day, I asked her, can I go through her DVD collection, something I don't normally do in someone else's house, and I found a DVD called Shame from Within. The subject on the cover really touched my heart. It was God's perfect timing. I went home, I put on the DVD player and settled in my chair and pressed the play button. My dearest pastor and friend, the first 20 minutes of that DVD made me freeze like an ice block in my chair. I'm not joking. I've never heard this teaching in my life before. I never thought I could be set free. I know that I know and what I know is was meant for me. It was about generational curses, all of those words that we speak over our own lives and over our children. Negative words are so powerful. I switched off the DVD player and I went on my knees and I repented for what I had spoken over my life since I was 11 years old. My dearest Maria, the very next morning I felt refreshed and, ref and rested. Up until now, I have only enjoyed good night's rest. Headaches are all gone. Praise God. 
was a beautiful testimony. I was just so blessed after yesterday. And I really want to thank the setup team uh, for being here, Daniel, um, uh, Caesar, um, who else, everyone who came in to help. I can't name everyone. Uh, Simone and May and Pusa, thank you so much. Uh, Elvis, um, your help yesterday was immaculate. Right from 12.30 that we were here setting up, doing everything, getting it all ready. And uh, then ready, getting ready for the evening uh, set up for church as well. I just want to thank you guys for your immense help. You know, little things like this um, make work easy for everyone, and you can really enjoy God's presence and fellowship. Isn't that awesome? Church, and that brings me to my message this morning. It's called Prevailing Prayers. You're probably wondering, Pastor Murray's always been preaching on prayers these last few weeks. I believe it's important. I believe. God's calling our church to pray. You know, we can have many, um, many uh, 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 situations happen around us, a lot of distractions, um, and we pray. Uh, we have, we, we say, did you pray this morning? Yes, I prayed this morning. It could have been two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. Uh, then there's intercessory prayer. You stand in the gap and you pray. And then there's that supplication kind of prayers. But today I want to talk about prevailing prayers. Prayers where you are in that situation. I want to give you some definitions at the moment, but it's in that situation between you and God, and you want to see something come through. But there are lots of hindrances when it comes to prevailing prayers. And one of the biggest hindrances is ourselves because we do not prioritize God's word. We do not prioritize God in our lives enough. But I want to encourage Follow Me Church. You know when that sanctuary is up and running? By the way, the most, one of the most important things for this morning for you to pray about is the 6th of September. We all go before JDAP. Um, uh, and I'm praying, I'm going to call for a fasting prayer uh, just before that in this next week. Um, I want you to stand with me in prayer as we, the committee goes up and we wait for the final decision on the sanctuary. Coming through that sanctuary are going to be a lot of people where we, we are going to be ministering to. But not one of us can minister if we don't have time to go into God's presence. And I'm not talking 10 minutes, half an hour. I'm talking really prevailing in God's presence for situations, for lives, for changing your family circumstances, for praying for that loved one, for, for asking God to bring a, a successful outcome to something. I'm talking about prevailing prayers. I'm not talking about ordinary prayers. There are many reasons that Christians do not pray as they should. You know, we, are, we forget sometimes that we are in a spiritual battle. And God wants us to always be ready with prayer. He is a commander in chief. When you go and join the army, the navy, the air force, you take orders from your commanders and you do what your commander says. In your workplace, you do what your boss says. Sometimes, yeah, they might be right or wrong or whatever, but you're in the business line and you draw the line as to where the right and wrong starts. But we're very willing to, uh, to oblige the secular standards of, of law and order because it's visible. You back answer your boss, you can get terminated. You can get sacked from the Army, Navy, and Air Force. But you don't see a God before you in every way to reach out and touch him. You're walking by faith. So it's harder to take instruction. Though we all have a manual before us. How many of us really know that manual and know the God of this manual? I want to challenge you this morning. Church is not just about what we want to see God like. It's about how God needs to be in our realm of things, of who he is in our lives. That's the difference. So even if we have neglected to pray, God still wants us to come to him in every way. God wants us to be on time. God wants us to come into his presence and seek his wisdom. Rob gave a classic example. When you make a decision without God and how you feel in your spirit, and more so, church, we've got the Holy Ghost with us. We've got the Holy Spirit with us. 
The Holy Spirit has been given to us to, to enable us to pray. Don't look at someone else who uses big fancy words and, um, you know, I can quote scriptures from, from Genesis to Revelation. The Word of God says the Holy Spirit can give you utterance on how to pray. Let's turn to Psalm 6, please, and I'm going to talk about prevailing prayers, Psalm 6. And the Word of God says, Psalm chapter 6, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also so vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who will give thee thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. The tears, he's talking about David. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eyes consumed because of grief. It waxes old because of all my enemies. Depart from me, all workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. Has the Lord heard your voice today? Have you gone into God's presence today and really heard, has he really heard your cry? Verse 9, the Lord hath heard my supplication. David knew that when he was in God's presence, crying out his heart and soul, the Lord heard his supplication. It wasn't just a two-minute prayer. He was in the presence of God. And he says, the Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and so vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. Let's bow our heads. Father God, I pray this morning that the power of the Holy Ghost will continue to come and sanctify every one of us. That we will be honorable instruments to you, God, and not to man. Lord Jesus, you are asking us this morning to seek your face. You are asking us to come into your presence. You are trying to prepare us for what is coming. Lord, I pray that every one of us who hears this message this morning will be motivated to seek your face, will be motivated to go into your presence even more hungry. Lord, we want to seek your face like never before. We want to know you like never before. Have your way in us, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, we are commanded to pray. We are commanded to pray when we are in our highs. We are commanded to pray even in our low times. We are commanded to pray when we are in good health or in ill health. We are commanded to pray in our prosperous times or even when you don't have money in your bank account. Prayer is a vital part of every believer's life. I cannot emphasize that even more. And the Lord has rebuked me so much because sometimes even me as a pastor, I can pass by prayer and not give it the importance that God wants us to have in our lives. That communication. And God's asking us today, he wants us to go to that next level of prevailing prayers. What is the motivation of prevailing prayers in our lives? Many Christ Christians want to pray, but they cannot understand why they can't sit still in the presence of Almighty God even for more than five minutes, even for more than half an hour. Even for more than an hour, people start to get restless. They want to look at their washing or their cooking or their kids or anything else. What is it that stops us from being, uh, from being sending up to God that those prevailing prayers? So what is prevailing prayer? It's a prayer that causes us to stretch. It causes us to strain. It's a prayer 
said that that wants us to move forward, to advance forward over a particular matter. It's a prayer that where when you pray those prayers, your aim is to overcome or gain over a situation. It's an overcoming prayer. It's a it's a gainful prayer. It's a prayer where you want to take superiority over a circumstance in your life. Where you want to gain an added advantage over that situation. But not of your strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit because you're in the presence of God. It's a prayer where the, the word of God says it's a force to be effective. A force that has a power of influence over that situation. And the only power of influence over any situation man faces is God. It's the Holy Spirit. And it's a prayer where you persuade, you, you persuade, you induce some kind of change in your circumstance because of your faith. Because of, because of God's power working through your faith. In fact, I've got here, prevailing prayer is a prayer that moves God into action. That's the kind of prayer I'm speaking about this morning. But there are often hindrances to prevailing prayer. And the first hindrance to prevailing prayer is that <clears throat> many people have a hard time believing that their prayers are accepted. Many people know, even as Christians, that God hears their prayers. But many people have a hard time believing that their prayers are accepted by God. Now, why do I say that? Because people have a hard time believing that they themselves are accepted of Jesus Christ and of God. Ephesians 2 verse 18 says, For through him... We both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Through the Holy Spirit, through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for us, we have access to the Father. So it's not just that God hears your prayers. You've got to go one step more and say, God has accepted my prayer offering today. He has not only just heard me, but he's accepted where I have come to him and I've laid out on the altar everything that I need him to change in my life. Because you and I have access to God. Look at Ephesians 3 verse 12. It says, in him we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. And we have boldness to access God. And not just say, oh, God heard my prayer. No, I want to take it a step further to say, he not only heard my prayer, he's accepted my offering, my, my prayer offering that has gone up into the throne room. Romans 5 verse 2 says, by whom also you have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know what that means? That when you come by faith to access God, you're knocking on God's door. You're standing by faith, by grace, because of what Jesus did on the cross. Church, how many of us can go into our closets? How many of us can go into those prayer moments and believe that it is purely by faith, by, by the grace of God that you can enter into the holy of holies, into his presence and know that he's not just hearing you, he's accepting your praise. He's accepting your prayer for that time. You see, church, you, you need to remember you are who you are speaking to. I need to remember that. I need to remember that I'm speaking to the creator God who was and is and is to come. That changes my dynamic of prayer because I'm no longer just speaking to this unseen person. I'm speaking to the king of kings who's alive. And he just doesn't hear me, but he says, my child, I not only hear you, but I accept your burden today. I accept your intercession today. I accept how you're warring today for that situation. I accept that today. You see, church, we are totally accepted.
accepted by God, not by any good thing you or I have done. We are totally accepted by God only because of Jesus' righteousness. That's it. We, when we stand before God, it's only by Jesus' righteousness that we go in. Nothing that you have done or your talents or my talents, my qualifications, they hold nothing. It is purely by the blood of the Lamb that I stand there covered, clothed in righteousness. You know, if you do not believe that that's how you are going into God's presence, going not of your doing, going not because you hold a ministry position or you're a pastor, if you suddenly realize, I'm actually nothing. But with God's righteousness, I enter into the holiest of holies place and I stand there before my maker. What a powerful thought that is. Your prayer life will never be the same again. In fact, every minute you, you, you want to run home and get your kids to pray or get your family to pray or you want to go and find that quiet place to pray because that's how you will go into God's presence. Nothing of you but all of Jesus. And church, we need to realize that we come in honor of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. We come in the honor of what Jesus did on the cross. That's how we come into the prayer room of God. We come in honor. We come by faith that our prayers are going to be accepted. How God chooses to deal with them, it's his business. But I come by faith that I'm not only being heard, but he's going to accept my, my offering of prayer. And because I have been accepted by faith into God's kingdom, I am now a child of God. Are you with me, church? I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I am convinced today that I am accepted. I am under the blood and I have, I have total access to God, my father. I am convinced today that I am. And I want you all to know, know deep down in your heart, there is no way that you can go into God's presence and have nothing to say to God. Because remember, the enemy looks for an empty mind. When you go into God's presence, you go in engaging because you want to be there. And your eyes are focused on him. I'm talking where your mind can have all other issues and you're in God's presence. You see, church, unless we are convinced of this fact and you know in your heart that your prayers are accepted, you cannot be in prevailing prayer situations. Turn with me to Ephesians 1 verse 5. Ephesians 1 verse, verse 5 says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. In other words, God had already decided to adopt every one of you, not for anyone else's pleasure, for his pleasure, he, he decided that you were going to be called his son and his daughter. That's the access that we have into God's kingdom. That's the access we have into his throne room. I want to encourage you this morning. You know, God, Jesus saw me with my dirt. Jesus saw me with my absolute rebellion. And he still died for me. And he still set me free. You know why verse 6, uh, verse six says out of the same chapter, you know why he did that? Because it says to the praise of the glory of his grace. Because we want to give him praise that that's who I was, but now this is me. And it says, wherein he had made us accepted in the beloved. Now you may say to me, Pastor Maria, I know I'm accepted. I've heard that. I heard the preaching before. I've, I've read this before. I've read the scriptures before. But I am too convicted now because I'm still struggling with my area of sin. But I want to say to you this morning, church, you see, we come with the guilt and condemnation to God that is not of God. The Holy Spirit gives conviction. But if you're living with guilt and condemnation and you're not ready to let go of that sin, you cannot come into God's presence. And that's where I'm at this morning, you know. We need the mercy of God. 
We need the grace of God. You know, this is our righteous judge. This is who we need. When we fall, we need to go to our high priest. When Adam fell, he ran and hid. When we fall into sin, when we are tempted and we fall into sin, we need to run to Jesus, not run away from him. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. And this is a beautiful passage of how, of how Jesus knew, knows everything that you and I go through. Hebrews 4, verse 14 to 16. Let's read together, church, because I think this is so powerful for any of you who are sitting here today and you think that sin is too big. God wouldn't understand. I want to show you something this morning in Scripture. It's seeing, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come, how boldly, and to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you woke up this morning and said to the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, I just thank you for, for setting me free from every curse of sin and bondage that I have been previously. God bless you. You know, someone once said to me, Pastor Maria, you know, I'm just hooked on pornography. I know the word of God, but I just cannot get rid of it. I, I'm basically tied to it and bound by it. You know, I feel like, you know, my sin keeps wanting me to go into that area all the time. And I'm going to say to you, church, there's something wrong when you cannot release yourself from, from something that God does not wish for you to do. You know, we have a great high priest, and it says in that scripture that he went through every temptation that you and me went through, but yet without sin. Yet without sin. Turn to someone and say, he was without sin. So you have hope. You have hope because when you fight that sin, you're fighting it from the power of the Holy Spirit residing in you through the blood of Jesus and what he did on the cross. By the way, you know, if you're still dealing with any pornography, I tell you it's a demonic stronghold that can destroy your families, your marriage, your children, and your ministry. God says, I'm a discerner of the thoughts and the heart of man. And it's time for us, you know, if you come back to him. So point one was, many people have a hard time believing that their prayers are accepted. Point two is, the thing that stops us from going into prevailing prayer mode is guilt and condemnation. And if there's anyone here this morning who is guilty and feeling condemned, you know, because we can all build up a reservoir of guilt, isn't it? I didn't go to church for five, six weeks, or, you know, I've never read my Bible for this, and I didn't do this, and I don't know if God's going to love me and accept me. You know, it's the devil is a liar. He sows all that stuff into your mind. I want to encourage you this morning, do not let the devil beat you with condemnation. The Lord shows us his mercy and grace. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 32. It's a powerful message from God this morning. Jeremiah 2 verse 32, a beautiful scripture. It says, can a maid forget her ornaments? Can a young girl forget her ornaments? Oh, I've got them on today. Or a bride her attire? Can a bride forget her wedding gown? Can she forget the, 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 the gown that she's going to be wearing? Yet... Let's read together. Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. God saying, for days my own people who I have called and I have chosen have forgotten me. And it's days, not one day, two days, seven days, days without number. God saying to us this morning, you read on from Jeremiah, the next chapter says, turn back. Turn back. I'm willing to give you a chance. Turn back. That's what God's saying to us this morning. If anyone is here, church, I want you to be so powerful that you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit every single day, every single moment. And if you want to get more of God in your life, the only best place is on your knees in prayer. 
That's the only best place where you can see God work and God sing, come back. Turn back today. The third area where we can struggle with prevailing prayer is when we use God only in times of crisis. Because we do, you see church, when we use God in terms of crisis, we do not, use, we do not see his victory over every situation in our lives every day. And God is so gracious that even in times of crisis, he comes to our rescue because he's a gracious and merciful God. But there's going to come a time when then, when everything's going to come to an end and then you're going to be hung dry. And God's saying to us this morning, you know that when you receive that telephone call, when you've been asked to go and get a second opinion about your medical health, that's the time normally people will run and say, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God. I'm going to bring this through. But God's challenging us this morning. Do you want to be called a person who is prevailing in prayer every day? Then do not just seek God in times of crisis. You know, turn with me to Psalm 107 verses 5 to 6. Psalm 107 verses 5 to 6. I'm, I'm showing you how merciful God is towards his people. He loves you and me so much. You know, he truly, he's, he's demonstrating to us every day that when we call him, he hears us, he answers us in different ways. But yet he's saddened because he says, once the answer is given, you go back on your merry way. You don't tarry in the presence. You don't, you don't rest with me. You go back and you do your own things. And then when things get really bad, you come back into my presence. And God's saying, where are you prevailing? How are you succeeding? What was the meaning of prevailing? To succeed, to get superiority over your situation. Church, we got to wake up. If we want to walk victorious in our workplaces, if we want to walk victorious in our schools, in everywhere that we go, we've got to be in the presence of God every day. Every day. Psalm 107 verses 5 to 6 says, Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Their soul fainted in them. When was the last time my soul fainted? I cannot remember. I don't even know if I got to that point. Have I ever gone to God in that point? Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. This is a beautiful God who comes through again to say, I still love you. I'm still here. Can you now walk with me because I've shown you a little miracle? But we sometimes leave it and we walk behind and we say, yep, that's done. Now, God, it's all good. Do you remember my sermon a couple of weeks ago? I said to you, <coughs> the best way to lead your life is when things are going right to go even more deeper into God's presence. Because when things go wrong, you're prepared. That's what God's word is saying to us this morning. Do not use God as just a person to sort your issues out. Use God even on the mountaintops. You see, why does God so faithfully answer our prayers? He doesn't need to because we are such a rebellious generation. But I want to draw you to verse 31 and 32 of Psalm 107. Let's read together. And I believe that this is the reason. When you read Psalm 107, it talks about how people just go back and they pray in their distress. God delivers them and then they wander again. But now it says, I think this is the, the clincher or the deal. It says, let's read together. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. You know, we have testimony times on a Sunday morning. We didn't have one today, but every Sunday we have a testimony time. You know, this is where we come and say, Lord, a church, I tarried in God's presence for this situation. And I may not have got my answer, but God spoke in this way, and I just praise him today. That's exactly, every day should be a miracle for us. Every day we should see the hand of God in every situation for us. Even if you've got a conference, had a massive fight or an argument or whatever it might be with your spouse or whoever it might be, you still see God through that situation because God said, what can I change in your life today? What is it that I can do for you today? You see, church, the Lord answers your cry and mine with the hope that 
with the hope and desire that after the dis- after the disaster is gone and the crisis has been averted we will just thank him but how often have we forgotten to thank the lord how often have we forgotten to thank the lord you know god says today that to us somehow church i want you to come this morning into my presence somehow can you commit somehow to come into my presence not just to pray but to have prevailing prayers to have supplication kind of prayers to have intercessory prayers to have warfare prayers the lord is waiting for his people this morning church i have never gone into the secret place into the closet of prayer with a prayer manual because you know what you can get any author to write you a prayer manual it ain't going to work because those kind of prayers are just between you and god it's what god can see right deep down into your heart when you close those doors and you are on your knees praying the only thing that happens is you and god there's no prayer manual around that can help you with that it's the transparency with which you go into the presence of god god wants a humble and a contrite spirit that's what god wants for all of us fourthly Some Christians don't pray the way they with prevailing prayers because they've learned to live without prayer. You know the saddest part for me sometimes when you do funerals and things like that or when people you know are are or even on their deathbed and you you just look at their lives and they say you know pastor I I could have done better. I could have spent more time with my children teaching them to pray. I spent more time sending them off to university. to learn life skills i spent more time watching tv and learning about the world news but lord i today i confess that i never spent time teaching my children and my my spouse the word of god and how to pray prayer is your powerful weapon young people if you want to succeed in life you you may be going to university you might be doing whatever you want to do be a doctor engineer pilot whatever you want to do You can never be successful God's way without prayer. Amen. Without prayer, you'll be successful in the eyes of the world, but not in the eyes of God. Church, I've never known us to go before God one day and stand before him and say, "You know God, yes, I didn't spend time with you on earth and I watched television, the bold and beautiful and whatever the salon or whatever. I watched all these master chef programs and I know that was my bonding time with my family, but now I've come to the gate and I'm waiting for you to let me in because I'm going to spend all eternity to get to know you. God's going to say I have no time for you because you didn't have time for me. You didn't have time for me. I don't have time for you. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy to open your mouth and pray. And even if it's a prayer that's not coming out nice and loud, even if it's a prayer from your heart, pour it out to the Lord. Let the tears go. Be in his presence. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse I'm going to read the first for a couple of verses after that. 1 Samuel chapter 1 and reading from verse 10. We're talking about Hannah and and God's word says she was in bitterness of soul. And I gave you read together church. She was in bitterness of soul and she prayed unto the Lord and she wept so. Turn to someone and say she was so it was painful. It was so painful to uh, she she poured out her whole heart to the presence of God and it came to pass in verse 12 as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth he was watching her you know he marked her mouth what was she mumbling about now Hannah she spake as and she prayed in her heart only her lips moved you may be a Hannah today You may not be one that's going to get up and give a big voluminous descri- description of prayer. But if you're a Hannah today, do it. Go into God's presence. And Eli said unto her, "How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away your wine." 
You know, it's so easy for us to cast uh, allegations against somebody. And Hannah said, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. That's a prevailing prayer. That's a prevailing prayer where you've gone in because you want God to turn that situation around. I want you to go home and do your homework and read First Samuel. And you and even read, you know, chapter 9 and get a bit of background on, on, on Hannah. That's a prevailing prayer because she poured her heart to the Lord. And church, what did God do? What did I say in the beginning? God moves when a, when a person is doing prevailing prayer. When a person undertakes prevailing prayer, God moves. And who did he give Hannah? Samuel, don't tell me God doesn't answer prevailing prayers. Moms and dads, all God's saying to you today, go into his presence and go, Lord, I need help. And open your heart. You know, the last JDAP meeting, I was sitting there and as Vincent and everybody was being questioned and I was just praying, you know, Lord, in my spirit, wisdom, wisdom. Wisdom, Lord. Every single night, I rebuke the enemy with that word, and I rebuke them. You know, every every uh, opp opposing word, I rebuke that, Lord God, Father. But I pray for wisdom. I pray for wisdom right now. You see, you've got to prevail and see what God's done. He's done a mighty, different, beautiful uh, layout, drawn by the neighbors and given us more room and then more more beautiful spaces to meet in. The last one I want to bring to you. Our perverted priorities affect prevailing prayers. You see, church, priority is something that you place importance on. Christians who neglect prayer have a base priorities. And I'm saying that from a, a holy versus unholy perspective, okay? Because if we don't get our priorities right as to where God wants us to be, it's not of God's kingdom. You know what I'm saying? We need to get it right. We need to come into God's presence. Each week we must be seeking Christ. Not thinking about, you know, you, I know you've got to do your housework, like wash the car, take the dog for a walk, cook your food, or, you know, you're going to have a lot of complaints at home. You've got a lot of things to do. But I want to encourage you this morning, set your clock an hour earlier. Go to bed an hour sooner if you need to, if you need your beauty sleep. But those of you who tarry in prayer, I'm sure you'll tell me today that you are never tired. In fact, your strength increases because you've been in that prayer mode. God energizes your spirit because you've been in that prayer mode. The Holy Spirit is just so vibrant in your life and you just think, it's okay, God. I can do this because you are with me. Church, I want to, God does not want any leftovers. He's not a God who takes over leftovers. You know, he doesn't say, first go and finish all these things and then we'll think about prayer. God says, give me the first fruits. Give me your, your tithes and offerings. Give me your, your prayer life. Give me the first of everything and I will bless you. Not the leftovers. God does not want leftovers. Turn with me to Malachi chapter 1 verse 8. Uh, this, this is so important church. This is such a powerful scripture. Malachi chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 8. And this is what it says. He, you know, God's saying, I don't, this, he's saying, I don't want your leftovers that are like a, like a, here, Lord, this is the, this is my little time that I have and I'm going to just going to give it to you right now. God does not want that. It's a lame offering that's polluting the altar of God. We need to get that right. If you're giving God leftovers, that means you're polluting the altar of God. God wants the best. God wants the best. Can you turn to someone and say, I'm going to give God the best? Let's read Malachi chapter 1 verse 8. Please, can we read together? If we offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? If we offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person? Saith the Lord of hosts. God's literally saying here, if you bring your faulty animals as an offering, do you think that's going to be holy? Would you even go to the king or go to the prime minister and give him a faulty offering? I think he's going to be happy. 
How then can you give me, God, a leftover of your offering? How can you even come into my presence with leftover time, leftover situations, leftover work? Church, I don't know who I'm speaking to. I'm speaking to myself as well when I do this sermon. Psalm 6 says, Oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. Neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. David knows that the Lord is angry with him. The Lord is upset with him. And he says, have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal my bones. His situation was such that every part of his body was aching. He says, my soul is also so vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long do I have to keep waiting in your presence? Have you asked the question, Lord, how long, Lord, I've been waiting, Lord, it's been eight years, 10 years, 20 years. I'm praying for the salvation of my family, Lord, but how long, Lord, have you asked that question in prevailing prayer? It says, return, O Lord, deliver my soul, save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee, in the grave who shall give thee thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Tears of a man who can do nothing but cry. Have you been in that situation where you cannot do anything else but just weep in the presence of God? And then he goes on in verse 9. The Lord hath heard my supplication. You know why? Church, because God just doesn't hear. He says, the Lord. Now I want you to underline the next phrase. The Lord will receive my prayer. You see, we pray, God, you are here. You're hearing our prayer right now. But I think to you today, go one more step and say, I know you've received my prayer today. I know you've received it. Church, you see, the ability to pray the consistency of prayer and the willingness to pray depends on you and I trusting the work of the Holy Spirit and nothing else. I remember a time, church, where I think I shared this previously where I was in bed and I didn't want to get up so early in the morning. And I set my alarm to four o'clock and I thought, 10 more minutes, God, and I'm just lying in bed. And the first, the voice came saying, just this couple of words, get up kneel down and pray just just general and I went go five more minutes go just just five more minutes get up kneel down and pray and the more I stayed in bed the louder the voice got I looked at Eddie sleeping on the other side and I thought he ain't hearing that voice I am hearing that voice right now and the next time it was get up kneel down and pray I just jumped off my bed and knelt down and said whatever you want me to pray right now, I'm going to pray right now God speaks his Holy Spirit speaks. His Holy Spirit gives us utterance. And that's where I want you, church. I want you to come on this journey. You know, God's saying to us, you know, he's made a provision through the Holy Spirit for us to pray. I look at the Muslims, they pray five times a day. I look at the Buddhists, they chant all the time. You know, I look at all the Hare Krishnas and all those, they, they are always in a prayer mode. I look at Christians, but we forget we, have, we are so weak in our prayer time. The call of God is, oh, that my people will turn their hearts to me and pray. That's the call of God this morning. Just as I'm winding up, let it be a joy, church, for you to come into the presence of God. Let it be a joy. I'm going into my Father's presence. I'm going into my Father's presence, guarded by the Holy Spirit, standing on the righteousness of Jesus. Standing in grace, I'm going in honor of what Christ did on the cross for me. And I'm going with boldness to enter into the throne room of grace. If there is a lukewarmness, if there is a coldness today, can I ask that you stand up with me and let us ask the Lord to touch you this morning. I've got a short prayer that I'd like you to repeat after me. But can we all just stand, church? I believe it's important. I want you to just repeat after me. Nobody move or do anything. 
Church is not finished. We are in the presence of God. Just, just let's, let's just give God honor. Just repeat after me. Dear Lord, I need you. I thank you for your mercy. You have not abraded me today. You have not rebuked me. But you have called me in your love. I call upon the Holy Ghost to lead me, to guide me, and to woo me in prayer. Lord Jesus, sometimes I don't know how to pray. There are times I don't even know what it feels like. But today and now I open my mouth to say, let the Holy Spirit come upon me, lead me, draw me to prayer and to your presence. And as I yield myself to you, let the Holy Spirit pray through me and through my mouth. Let him do intercession. And I know how to call upon my God. Forgive me, Jesus, for neglecting you. Lord, blot out my sins. Blot out my transgressions. I come to you by faith. Asking you, Lord, to take the lukewarmness out of my heart and set me on fire for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.